This is Singapore Tonight. Good evening, I'm Dawn Tan. Tonight's top stories. The health ministry is working to ensure patient care is not disrupted as the cluster at Tan Tok Seng Hospital widens. All polyclinics are barring entry to visitors who've recently been in Tan Tok Seng Hospital wards. Singapore and Hong Kong are monitoring their COVID-19 situations ahead of their air travel bubble. They urge caution in reopening borders. Five Kutek Pot Hospital staff disciplined for lapses that led to the wrong treatment for some breast cancer patients. Cloud kitchens cook up a storm here in Singapore. At least five new kitchens opened their doors for business over the last six months. I'm Steve Lai. Also tonight, India's Supreme Court orders the government to, to ensure enough oxygen supply in Delhi by midnight. The European Union eyes opening up. Fully vaccinated travellers could be allowed to enter the bloc. I'm Elizabeth Neo with your Asia Business Update. Singapore's factory activity at its highest in over two years. Plus a dramatic rise in e-commerce sales as more people stayed at home last year. Hospitals here in Singapore have been asked to defer all non-urgent treatment as the country battles a COVID-19 cluster, the largest active one so far. The Tan Tok Seng Hospital cluster now has 35 cases, with eight more today. The health ministry says that the move is to conserve resources, which includes reserving hospital beds for any potential rise in COVID-19 cases. The ministry adds that it worked out that these measures with all private and public hospitals to ensure that patient care isn't disrupted. It's also assuring the public that no hospital will deny health care to patients who need it. To keep other hospitals safe, it says stricter entry will be imposed for those who had been to TTSH. Some inpatients may be asked to defer their visits. Authorities are also urging the public to only visit the emergency room for life-threatening situations. These include persistent chest pain or serious injuries. Longer wait times are also to be expected, as other hospitals help to absorb Tan Tok Seng Hospital's A&E patients. More medical staff have been deployed to TTSH in the meantime, which stopped admitting new inpatient cases from Sunday. Ambulances will divert to other hospitals to balance the patient load. For outpatients who need specialist in-person care, staff not linked to the cluster will attend to them. All others will have teleconsultations. All three polyclinic groups in Singapore say they are barring visitors who've recently been in Tan Tok Seng Hospital wards from entering their premises. Uh, they're also allowing only one caregiver per patient. The move is in tandem with the public hospitals, which put similar restrictions in place at the weekend. Liang Lei reports. Disruption from Singapore's first hospital COVID-19 cluster is spreading to its polyclinics. At Clementi Polyclinic this morning, staff could be heard asking visitors if they've been to Tan Tok Seng Hospital's wards in the past two weeks. CNA understands that caregivers who were recently in the wards will be barred entry to the polyclinics. But patients themselves with the same visiting records will still be allowed in. Fellow patients weren't bothered at all. I think still okay because uh, I think we still take the uh, precaution. Eh? I really have the jack. I completed my jack after nothing. So I don't worry about all these things. The National Health Care Group says patients who stayed in or visited the Tan Tok Seng Hospital wards will be triaged appropriately for consultation in its six polyclinics. In addition, those arriving to receive COVID-19 jabs will first need to test negative for the virus. Singh Health's nine polyclinics are also advising its patients who have recently been in Tan Tok Seng Hospital wards to defer non-urgent treatment. It says staff can help patients should their caregivers not be allowed to enter the premises. 
Some public hospitals have been advising people to seek treatment at polyclinics to reduce the load on their A&E departments. But polyclinic patients CNA spoke with today did not notice much change in their waiting times. The time is uh, it's, it's almost the same, uh, not so long. Uh, I think that about 30 to 40 minutes is the normal time. We still like, yeah, it's normal. It's just additional one question. Recently, you go Tan Tok Seng or not? Other patients say the clinics seemed to have stepped up their game today, with more staff and more proactive ushering at the waiting areas. It was a different scene outside Singapore's regional screening centres this morning. Snaking queues appeared as hundreds rushed to get tested for COVID-19. It's part of surveillance efforts to detect cases hidden in the community that could be linked to the Tan Tok Seng Hospital cluster. Sherlyn Xia with this report. This street in Bishan was a flurry of activity as hundreds flocked to this regional screening centre to get swapped for COVID-19. It's the first day of surveillance testing for people who may have been exposed to cases in a Tan Tok Seng hospital cluster. This includes previously discharged patients from the hospital or visitors to the premises, as well as those who were in the same places as the confirmed cases. Some have been waiting in line here for as long as five hours. But for the staff here, it's all hands on deck, as they also have to handle the routine testing of workers in the construction, marine shipyard and process sectors. It's around 12.30 now and the centre's doors are closed for lunch break. But as you can see behind me, there is already a queue starting to form 30 minutes before doors are set to reopen. But those who don't wish to wait, however, have been given a sticker with a designated time slot for them to come back at. Despite the long wait, many weren't willing to give up their spot in line. At another screening centre in Ang Mo Kyo, people were still queuing under the hot midday sun. Staff even took chairs out to help ease the wait for those in line. The screening centres will remain open from 9am to 4pm daily, and the surveillance testing operations for the Tan Tok Seng Hospital cluster will run until 16 May. Businesses near Tan Tok Seng Hospital are feeling the ripple effect of uh, having a COVID-19 cluster in the vicinity. As more offices there switch to working from home, a footfall and sales have dropped. Let's go with more. It's barely 2 p.m., but this business owner is already packing up two hours early. No point in staying open any longer, he says. His stall is a short walk from the hospital, where there's a growing cluster of COVID-19 cases. Others in the area are also feeling the pinch, although some are seeing more food delivery orders. Check-ins at one gym here has dipped about 10% too. Generally, the area in Novena, the mall itself, um, traffic has slowed down, so we see less people generally. Uh, those who come into the workouts to, to do their workouts are generally focused on coming in, doing their workouts and going back home. To reduce crowds, staff of public agencies there, like the Ministry of Home Affairs, have been asked to work from home. Likewise for the Inland Revenue Authority of Singapore, which has also closed taxpayer counter services temporarily. Companies are not taking any chances either. Our staff, all of them actually show concern. We, you know, they actually feedback to us that they are quite worried about their daily commute, you know, where actually Novena station was quite crowded and even lunchtime, we had to be vigilant in terms of all this. So we did take actually uh, actions that, you know, to, to ask the staff to work from home as a default mode. UOL, which manages Novena Square, says it has reminded tenants to monitor their health and be mindful of safety measures. Besides the eight in the TTSH cluster, there are two other local transmissions reported. They are among the 17 new cases today. None are in the dormitories. Seven are imported. They were placed on stay-home notice or isolated upon arrival. The national tally now stands at 61,235. Singapore and Hong Kong are monitoring the COVID-19 situation on both sides as they prepare for their air travel bubble.
that will allow quarantine-free travel starting later this month. Now, both sides say reopening of borders has to be done cautiously, adding that safeguards like criteria for suspension are in place. The comments come as community cases surge in Singapore over the past week. Well, now we are grappling with a cluster of infections breaking out in one of our hospitals. But fortunately, and as of now, unlinked cases in the community have remained low. To reopen borders, governments need to differentiate the risk of different regions. Try to open up cautiously with regions that have kept domestic infections low. And at the same time, tighten up on places which have high infection rates. It is the only way. The ministry says that they must be prepared to make adjustments as the COVID-19 situation evolves. Mr. Ong was at a virtual APEC dialogue attended by over 400 business leaders and government officials. Topics discussed included the role of digital health passports and vaccinations when travel resumes. Hong Kong requires its residents to be fully vaccinated before leaving on the air travel bubble flights. We are all set for the double inaugural flight scheduled in three weeks' time to be launched on May 26. But we will, of course, continue to observe and keep a very close watch on our respective situation. Over 1.5 million doses of vaccine have been administered, meaning that over 14.5% of eligible population already taking their first step. Hello there. In business tonight, Singapore's factory activity recorded its highest reading in more than two years after expanding for the 10th straight month in April. This comes on the back of growing new orders, new exports and employment. The Singapore Purchasing Managers Index, or PMI, rose to 50.9 in April, up 0.1 from the previous month. A uh, reading above 50 points uh, indicates that the sector is expanding. And the PMI for electronics also rose for the ninth straight month, driven by global demand for components used in 5G networks, as well as electric vehicles, AI, and other high-end technologies. The employment index across the manufacturing sectors rose 0.2 point to 50.3 in April. A factory output inventory and supply deliveries also recorded slow expansion rates. One economist cautions that increasing automation may slow job growth, while supply constraints may also dampen overall manufacturing activity. Uh, case loads, infections in many of the regional countries has continued to pick up. Um, and that's not good news uh, for Singapore, which is a regional manufacturing hub. Even though we have seen very clear sign of recovery, uh, we are not entirely out of the wood from this crisis. Certain sectors, certain industries are still struggling. Um, so it is important that the manufacturing sector continue to pick up the slack and continue to drive overall uh, economic growth. Hong Kong's economy has rebounded sharply in the first quarter, putting an end to nearly two years of decline. A GDP grew by 7.8% year-on-year, its fastest pace in more than a decade. That reverses the 9.1% contraction a year ago. Full-year GDP is expected to grow by between 3.5 and 5.5 percent. Again, a sharp pullback from the 6.1 percent decline in 2020, which was its worst on record. The rebound has been attributed to strong export growth thanks to the global economic recovery led by China and the U.S. But one analyst warns that the numbers don't tell the whole story. We have to be aware of... Uh uh, the base effect when we read this number, because the base was very negative, negative 9.1% uh, last year this quarter. So a small change will change the year-on-year -year growth rate a lot. And if you read the details of the um, data, actually consumption was still very weak, 1.6% increase from a very negative or, uh, base effect again. Uh, the only uh, supporters, I think, is uh, government. And of course, export growth and import growth was very good, but they offset each other and doesn't really contribute to the um, GDP growth rate. But in fact, they uh, make sports activities, activities uh, uh, more, vibrant, uh, more vibrant than 
before, which is uh, anyway a good thing. But looking ahead, it is not easy still. Yeah. Singapore Airlines has raised one and a half billion US dollars from the sale and lease back of 11 aircraft to four different parties. That's uh, seven Airbus A350s and four Boeing 787 claims. The carrier is grappling with the turbulence caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. It has been uh, seeking to boost its capital liquidity. Since it began its fundraising campaign last April, SIA has raised $11.6 billion. This was done through a rights issue, secured financing and issuance of convertible bonds. And CEO Go Chun Pong says SIA will continue to explore other ways to raise liquidity to respond to market conditions and capture all possible growth opportunities. The carrier reported a 99.6% decline in passenger numbers in April compared to the same period a year ago. We see varying rates of vaccinations and also varying rates at which different countries are opening up to their travel. Different companies are also very gradually, uh, you know, in restarting their corporate travel as well. So that will give the airline an extra bit of cushion. Uh, and perhaps it could also benefit from the rather low interest rate at this point and maybe generate a little bit, uh, you know, a bit more favorable terms um, in terms of the financing. COVID-19 lockdowns have boosted e-commerce around the world. A new study by the UN shows that online sales here in Singapore accounted for 11.7% of total sales last year, jumping from 5.9% in the previous year. As a whole, online sales made up 20% of total retail sales in the world last year, up from 16% in 2019. And the study crunched data from seven countries, representing two-thirds of global online trade. South Korea led the way with the highest share of 26%. China followed closely behind, and then the UK and the US. But the digital windfall was not enjoyed equally across the board. Companies offering ride-hailing and travel services saw sharp declines in their fortunes as people stayed home. The e-commerce boom is giving Singapore's warehouse operators a shot in the arm during the pandemic. Demand for warehouse space has gone up over the year and it's now close to 90% filled, according to data from JTC. Isabel Lim with more. From cat food to clothing to coconut drinks, you'll find them all under one roof in this new age warehouse. It provides storage, co-working and delivery solutions for about a thousand SMEs across four locations. Demand for warehouse space like this is increasing as more businesses enter the e-commerce market. Just a year ago, operators were seeing their lowest occupancy since 2017 at 87.5%. It's since risen to nearly 90%, even as supply went up. What has pandemic brought to us was a sharp spike in demand for e-commerce. Uh, and even changes to our lifestyle, so where we depend more on online shopping for our basic needs. By offering spaces as tiny as these and monthly leases, Spaceship makes it easier for smaller players to move in. Occupancy for its newest facility in the residential district of Amokyo has risen to about 70% since it opened nine months ago. They are small businesses who want sort of a margin of safety. They want um, to avoid long-term capital commitments, long-term lease commitments. Uh, they want to avoid committing to a large size of space because no one can really predict how demand is going to be like three months, six months, nine months from now. But operators like him are already banking on increased demand with new facilities in the pipeline. Warehouse space is set to grow by almost 7% within two years. And while there are delays with some migrant workers unable to travel in, this could benefit operators. Landlords do uh, prioritise the occupancy over rents for right now. Uh, but then that would also mean that um, as the supply is depleting, there could be a possibility of a slight uh, rental upside. She says operators that can differentiate themselves, such as by offering real-time inventory tracking using artificial intelligence or locations near transport hubs, will have a better shot at filling their spaces. 
Some optimism from the largest contract chip maker in the world, TSMC says it expects to be able to catch up with the minimum requirement of custom, customer demand for auto chips by the end of next month. But many believe the outlook for the semiconductor industry will likely get worse before it improves. As Victoria Jen reports, the severe drought in Taiwan is not helping. Pumping fresh water into his 25-ton tanker, water truck driver Chen Chongli's daily routine may seem trivial. But the 49-year-old has a part to play in ensuring the global supply of chips, vital to many industries from automobiles to smartphones. This as a water crisis threatened Taiwan's all-important chip industry. Xinzhu is home to Xinzhu Science Park, also known as Taiwan Silicon Valley, where the world's largest contract chip maker, TSMC, is headquartered. Since last month, Water supply for the park has been cut further by 13 percent from 11 percent previously, amid the island's worst drought in over half a century. To avoid disruptions to production, tech companies from the park are hiring private tanker trucks to transport water from northern regions like Taipei, where water supply has yet to be affected by the drought. The water situation remains precarious. Weather forecast predicts the raining season, which typically starts in May, will have less rain than usual. Behind me is Baoshan Second Reservoir, a major source of water for Xinzhu Science Park. Now, as you can see, the reservoir has almost bottomed out. If the dry spell persists, it could dry up completely within weeks. The stakes are high. Operational disruptions at companies like TSMC, which makes about half of all the world's chips, could further exacerbate a global chip shortage. An analyst said given its size and influence, if the chip industry suffers, so will the local economy. Authorities said they are already doing all they can to support Xinzhu's tech industry. The agency has also activated backup wheels with 30,000 tons of water and a desalination plant to provide another 13,000 tons of water a day. Even as Taiwan is trying to dig itself out of the current crisis, TSMC is already planning for the future. The company is building a water treatment plant capable of turning industrial wastewater into something pure enough for use in chip manufacturing. Victoria Jen, CNA, Xinzhu City. Updating tonight's top stories, the health ministry is working to ensure patient care is not disrupted as the COVID-19 cluster at Tantong Seng Hospital widens. It now has 35 cases with eight more today. Hospitals have been asked to defer all non-urgent treatment in order to conserve resources for any potential rise in cases. All polyclinics in Singapore are barring visitors who've recently been in Tantong Seng Hospital wards from entering their premises. Be mentally prepared for possibly more measures to curb the spread of another rise in COVID-19 cases. Education Minister Lawrence Wong made this call as he urged everyone to continue to work together to keep the situation under control. 
Speaking at Nian Polytechnic's graduation ceremony, Mr. Wong also unveiled a program by the institution that aims to get students career ready in a volatile and uncertain future. The personalized learning pathway program will enable Nian students to gain expertise in another discipline on top of their chosen field. For instance, business students may opt for a minor in cybersecurity. About 10 minors in emerging areas like data analytics will be offered in the pilot run, which began last month. For a start, over 1,000 students are expected to benefit. It's set to be fully rolled out in academic year 2023 for all full-time diploma students. But at some point, the pandemic will pass, the global economy will recover, and there will be new opportunities ahead of us. These additional skills will further strengthen their career resilience, enabling them to pivot more easily to new growth sectors and help them seize new opportunities in the future economy. Amid the recent spike in community cases, various segments of society say they are better prepared this time. This having learned from experience on how to fight the pandemic. One trade association says the majority of manufacturing firms have evolved their operations since the pandemic surfaced. Technology such as the use of sensors and monitoring systems now play a bigger role in operations. They include more people to work off-site and in turn enabled companies to adapt quickly. But when authorities recently urged employers to allow more staff to work from home as the number of cases rise. <laughs> believe that the, the, the framing of the scenario that we are still within the pandemic, that we have been continuously telling our members um, to, be, to be prepared and to build a resilient model uh, certainly would work under today's circumstances where you need to uh, relax and then you need to then uh, tighten. Uh, this will not be the first uh, and probably will continue to see some of these uh, changes quite rapidly. MPs from the People's Action Party have also been advised to conduct their Meet the People sessions, either virtually or by phone. One MP who had a session scheduled on Monday said his team had to scramble to inform residents of the new arrangement. Volunteers were on standby to inform residents who showed up physically. Resources were also diverted to handle phone calls and Zoom meetings. In the previous round, um you know, we, we already learned that uh, uh, not everybody can use Zoom. Uh, so this time round, we have uh, we have prepared a few, we bought a few uh, prepaid phone cards so that uh, the volunteers can uh, can call the residents uh, to their phone uh, if they are not familiar with Zoom. For more, we're joined this evening by Dr. Asok Kurop. He's infectious disease specialist at Mount Elizabeth Medical Center. Doctor, we've been asked to be mentally prepared for potentially more measures to stop the spread of COVID-19 here in Singapore. What sort of measures should we expect to possibly be rolled out and, and why would they be necessary? Yeah, thanks, Don, for that question. I think that the writing is on the wall because we have been seeing the surge in the number of clusters, which is quite telling because it's not the first time we are encountering this. We have had our fingers burnt with the first SARS epidemic and then with SARS-CoV-2 last year. But we know that we are better prepared this time. Our technology in terms of detection is way better. We have got a lot of the population on the Trace Together app. We have got infrastructure that has improved. Um, I think that overall we are much, much more prepared better this time round. And we have to deal with the way that things are evolving globally. There's a lot of um, uh, active infections happening around us, especially as we have to deal with the surge in cases in India and the subcontinent. So it is almost a matter of fact that something was going to disturb our uh, oasis of calm, if you will. And I think this is a test period for all of us. So we have to not kind of have a kind of a mental or, a, you know, fear about this, but to face these things and to take it in its uh, stead, because we cannot be um, laissez-faire. 
I think that now we will have to hunker down to some extent. I mean, we all, we don't want to have a circuit breaker. We are hoping that's not good for the economy, that's not good for our mental health. And we have seen how that happens time and again in different countries. But we have to all do our part uh, in a community, a global community, a regional community, and in, in our country itself, that we have to follow all the rules and we have to be even more obsessive about it because if we all want to not go into a serious lockdown, then we have to do our part. And I think that it's not as if a big surge is not going to come. We don't know about that. We will have to just pay attention to the science and the investigation as it pans out. But I think we have to be really vigilant and you know, simple measures that people tend to forget, like, you know, crowding. There's a lot of malls which are very crowded. Please, you know, people avoid that. And also when um, people talk in closed situations, in the lifts, for example, or in the MRT trains, we do all know. We have learned from the biology of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 that the majority of transmission happens in closed settings. So we have to be very mindful about that and how we interact with our fellow citizens in that context is, is actually going to be very important. I, I want to draw your attention to the fact that, you know, the Thanoxane cluster is just like a tip of the iceberg phenomenon. I think that what triggered was actually a case, uh, you know, which potentially could have been in the community for a bit. And the fact is that, you know, all of us may be having to deal with cases in many different areas of our work. We just have to be very careful how we interact in society. We, it's not um, everything rosy. It's not uh, business as usual. I think we have to really not be going to multiple social uh, you know, settings and try not to be a social butterfly. And you know, look, I think I see a queue down there with so many people. People have to kind of like keep safe distancing, wear masking. And be very careful as to how you play with your mask as you put them on and put them off and, you know, uh, appreciate that hygiene is extremely important. Um, yeah. You know, well, I Dr. Also, you're talking a lot about, about, sort of, <laughs> about the sort of the complacency sort yeah. of creeping in, perhaps. And it's somewhat understandable, isn't it? Vaccinations are underway. The economy is seen to be recovering. There's even been talk about travel bubbles in the pipeline. I, Do you see yeah, this as perhaps uh, it's very sad. The, big, the big challenge? Yes. Indeed, because it's human nature. I don't blame anyone. We are all looking forward to some kind of uh, escape, if you will. I think this is where we have been lulled into a sense of complacency and that we have been seeing that although many parts of the world has been experiencing resurgences and so we have been kind of like in our little bubble, as it were, and thinking that everything is uh, fine. But, you know, we are vulnerable. We can be... Um, as strong as our weakest link. So if we have got some part of the world where things are completely out of control, we remain completely completely vulnerable. And we, we have to bear that in mind. This is a new world. Um, you know, so I think that we cannot expect that it's going to be life as, as normal and that we can expect to be traveling anytime soon, etc. We have to now prevent a situation that we can go into a big, huge resurgence and a, a lockdown, that sort of thing. It's not, it's not the same. We have to be mentally prepared. I mean, it's a lot of mental fatigue. People get tired of these things. But surely we have done it before and we can do it again. I mean, you know, the fact is we have got vaccines. It's good. The rollout is happening. But we need more people to go out and get the vaccines. There's a lot of rumor mongering and people are concerned about the fact that you have got um, individuals who have broken through on the vaccine and so on and so forth. But I have you that the situation would have been much, much worse if the vaccine uptake in, say, for example, Tanok Singh Hospital was not as high as it, as it is. Indeed. We, we would have been experiencing a way bigger cluster, yeah. Indeed, Dr. Kurup. I mean, as you say, we all remain on the front lines of this fight against COVID-19. The battle does continue. Dr. Kurup, thank you very much for your perspectives this evening. Dr. Asa yeah. Kumar Kurup thanks, there John. from yeah, Mount thanks, Elizabeth bye. Medical Center. India's Supreme Court has ordered the government to fix Delhi's oxygen supply by midnight. Five Delhi hospitals have sent out 
SOS messages in the last 24 hours, including a children's hospital. New cases there continue to surge, with India's total caseload now nearing 20 million. Experts believe that the outbreak will peak this week. There's no rest for health workers amid India's deepening COVID-19 crisis. Even for this doctor, who lost his father to the coronavirus just days ago, and whose mother and brother are still in hospital. Overall situation is not difficult here. We cannot just uh, rest at home or uh, take rest at home and see the agony of other people because I had been through the uh, situation. Tha. New COVID-19 cases have risen by over 300,000 for a 12th straight day. A persistent shortage of beds, medicines and oxygen has left many to die while waiting for treatment. Hospitals continue to send out desperate appeals for oxygen supply on social media. But there is a glimmer of hope. The health ministry says positive cases relative to the number of tests have fallen for the first time since mid-April. Still, experts are calling for another full lockdown. At least 11 states and union territories already have some form of movement restrictions in place to try and cut the chain of transmission. In the meantime, vaccinations are pressing ahead with whatever limited supply there is. Get yourself vaccinated as soon as possible. It's very important. This COVID second wave is very dangerous. So you need to get yourself vaccinated as soon as possible. All adults are now eligible to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. But doses are in short supply in many states. Local media say the federal government has yet to order more supplies to cover the shortfall. Indonesia has found its first case of the highly infectious coronavirus variant first seen in India. The two cases were found in Jakarta. Authorities are working to contain the spread of these variants while numbers are still low. At the same time, people are being urged not to travel for the end of the Muslim fasting month. The chief of Indonesia's COVID-19 task force has told people not to return home for the annual exodus known as Mudik. This is the second year that it's been banned to curb COVID-19 transmission. The European Union may soon relax restrictions for non-essential travel from beyond the region. The proposal to ease travel curbs will consider a country's infection rates and allow entry only to fully vaccinated travellers if they've gotten EU-approved shots. For now, those are Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. Still, the EU remains cautious. A near blanket ban on non-essential travel into the European Union has been in place for over 12 months now. But now EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen saying it's time to, to rekindle cross-border friendships and to revive the EU's tourism industry and to encourage reciprocity from countries that have similar uh, levels of vaccination and similar levels of rate, the rates of infection as the European Union. So we know that Israel will definitely be put on this list list of countries who would face uh, limited restrictions entering the EU. The UK could be on that list as well, given the high levels of vaccination there. The US could be, although not uh, at this stage, was, was word from one EU co uh, official. What this would be is a better access into the European Union for anyone who's been fully vaccinated or coming for a country with low levels of infection. The EU is hoping to have these proposals signed off at the end of this month, following a meeting of EU leaders on May the 25th. Training activities conducted at the Home Team Academy will move online for the next two weeks or postpone until further notice. And that's after an Immigration Checkpoints Authority officer who works there tested positive for COVID-19 yesterday. All ICA staff and trainees from its training command and the academy will also be tested for the virus. All common areas with heavy human traffic will be disinfected. The academy is facilitating swabs for Home Team staff and trainees who were there during the period concerned. The officer last reported for duty on the 26th of April. He is the brother of an ICA officer who works at Changi Airport and tested positive on the 27th of April. Five of Kutekwat Hospital's management and staff have been disciplined over the incident involving wrong breast cancer results. 
The punishments include job terminations, fines and stern warnings, but the five weren't named when asked. A review committee says human error and inadequate quality control contributed to some patients receiving unnecessary treatment. The hospital has since apologised for the lapses, adding that it has reached out to all patients who were affected. About 200 were misdiagnosed with a typically more aggressive form of breast cancer. More than half received unnecessary treatment as a result, and they will be compensated. The review committee's independent investigation revealed that inaccurate HER2 positive results were caused by a suboptimal HER2 staining protocol. HER2 is a gene that controls how a healthy cell grows. The protocol was caused by human error when established. As a result, lab slides were overstained, which affected interpretation of the results. This led to a higher than usual positive HER2 rate. The error wasn't discovered as the hospital had failed to conduct rigorous checks at a point when the procedure was established. The committee has provided recommendations like retraining of staff. Another committee has been formed to ensure that the hospital implements all the recommendations. A Singaporean teen has been charged after threatening to kill an English Premier League footballer and his family. The threats came via Instagram last year. While, while in Singapore, 19-year-old Derek Ung Deren had sent the threats to Brighton and Hove Albion forward Neil Mope. The messages were sent on four occasions in June and July last year. And these came after a Premier League match when Arsenal goalkeeper Bernd Leno suffered a serious knee injury following a tackle from Mope. Ung faces four charges under Singapore's Protection from Harassment Act. If convicted, he could be fined up to $5,000, jailed up to six months, or both for each charge. All new hawker centres here in Singapore will have automated tray return systems, or ATRS, installed. The National Environment Agency told CNA that ATRS stations will also be progressively rolled out to suitable existing hawker centres. Ten have such systems in place already. We find out how useful they've been. <laughs> Thanks to this ATRS station, Bukit Merah Central Food Centre has been doing better at getting patrons to clean up after themselves. The NEA says seven in ten diners here returned their trays and used crockery. The rate comes down to about six in ten when taking into account all food centres with ATRS, which is still double the average of centres with manual tray return racks. But challenges remain for some who have issues with the fundable trade deposit. Usually the trade return system itself, right, uh, it gets broken re regularly. So that's why I don't want to use a trade. Over at privately run food centre Timber Plus, FNB Group Timber has seen a return rate of 98% since pioneering the trade return system five years ago. It halved the trade deposit in March and aims to waive it eventually. We are about two months into this reduced tray uh, deposit and return rate is still maintained at 98%. I think for the customer base at Timber Plus, they are already attuned to returning tray. While putting in ATRS may get more people to return trays, one advocate says the ultimate goal is to make the practice a cultural norm. And if all else fails... We have the law in place, you know, that actually littering on the table, leaving uh, trash on the table, leaving tissue on the table is an offence. So in the end, we may be forced to have to pay a fine in order to inculcate a culture. Dr. Wan adds that it's unsustainable to rely on cleaners, many of whom are getting older. Younger Singaporeans are also less willing to take up the job. Cloud kitchens are cooking up a storm in Singapore. Around five new kitchens sprouted over the last six months, according to the latest update by Enterprise Singapore. That's compared to just 10 in the preceding three years. With takeaways becoming the norm, operators say this might be the future of FMB. Geraldine Yap with more. Porridge, pizza, and ramen. 
cooking for five different restaurant brands in one place. These so-called cloud kitchens don't have dining spaces and are used mainly for takeaways and deliveries. About 60% fewer staff are needed here. It's how the Les Amis group meets new eating habits more quickly amid the pandemic. And two months in, business is brisk at this kitchen. For a single kitchen concept, uh, normally you need maybe five people. But in our area like this, uh, you can have eight people doing five cuisines. Customers of Kitch benefit the most because they can order from across different cuisines for one delivery fee. Meanwhile, over 20 brands rent spaces in this cloud kitchen in El Junin. It was opened by Grab around six months ago, its second in Singapore. Fusion sushi chain Maki San says it's a low-cost way to expand its reach in the area, which is quite a distance from its current outlets. Rental can be as little as one-third of a food kiosk in a shopping centre. We don't really have to put up a very high capital to renovate the shop or pay super high rental in a very nice shopping mall. And also the beauty of operating in, in Grab Kitchen is because we are, we are working in such small spaces, we don't actually need that many manpower. So that being said, we are able to do a lot of uh, food orders with very low costs. Tenants can not only tap on Grab's network of delivery riders, but also reach out to more customers who are using its app. Unlike in a brick and mortar kitchen, you don't really get the organic footfall. Uh, you have to think a bit harder about how to market yourself and how to reach your customers. Um, and again, with our Grab Kitchens, we try very hard to give our merchants the full access to our customer base. Um, and that really allows them to then market themselves to uh, many, many Singaporeans. The cloud kitchen market is expected to swell with more demand for deliveries. At least 25 more kitchens are set to open in the next five years. But operators say outlets will still be around because customers will want the experience of dining out, especially for special occasions. That's Singapore Tonight. Headlines anytime at cna.asia. You can also come find us on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter as well. Good night. Bye for now.